Well, a very good morning to you all. My name is Derek. I'm one of the church leaders here. It's a real privilege to, well, first of all, just to be with you. Secondly, to have this opportunity to speak. And it's just wonderful to be together. And I kind of want to ask you the question, how are you doing? But I'm not quite sure what answer to expect. And I suspect we'd all give very different answers to that question because... It's still pretty tough, isn't it? There's still so many differences and struggles and uncertainties around us. And that's why I think this new teaching series, which we start today, is going to help. And that's exactly what I'm doing today, is opening up a new series. We're actually basing this on the first letter which the Apostle John wrote. And three letters which he wrote are three books in our Bible. The Bible, such a precious book to Christians, it comprises 66 smaller books. And three of them are letters written by John. And we're focusing the next few weeks on his first letter. And actually, his encouragement to us through his letter is that we might be confident in our relationship with God and that we might live our lives looking more and more like Jesus. And can I just say at this point, I think this is the point of why we are church why we look at the Bible, why we teach on it, and why we worship together. The whole point is not so much to gain a whole load of new knowledge, but rather that our hearts and our minds are actually transformed so that we might become more and more like Jesus. And John even explains to us why he has written this first letter. And this is jumping right to the end of his letter where he says, I'm writing these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. In other words, John may as well have said, look, I've written this letter so that you might have confidence, assurance, and certainty that you have eternal life because of Jesus. And our final talk in this series will unpack that a little bit more. But I wanted to state that because John's explaining, look, the reason I'm writing this is so that you will be confident, so that you will be sure, so that you will know. And it would seem that when John was writing his letters these were tricky times. These were unsettling times. And it makes sense that what John wants to achieve in his writing, for the sake of the readers of his letter, is to instill confidence in them. And encouragement in them. And certainty in them. And as I'm thinking of why John wrote this letter, and for us to at least have a grasp of that... Doesn't it say something to us today in the here and now? Don't we, right now, need a whole load of encouragement and confidence and certainty? Because, I don't know about you, but it feels as though the last couple of years have been the most uncertain times in my lifetime, at least. And I'm fairly young, so others who are older may remember worse times, more unsettling times, I don't know. But I just feel that we're going through, still, unsettling times. So, Covid is still around. We're worried about climate change, and that's been pretty topical over the last few weeks. I mean, across our country, we've had staff shortages in retail and hospitality, haulage and care. 
And it wasn't that long ago that we were in queues at the petrol pumps. And I'm kind of thinking, don't we just now need a whole load of encouragement and confidence and certainty? So we're going to unpack a little bit of what John is saying to us so that we might have some of that, each and every one of us. And I, before I get into the detail, would you permit me some raw and open honesty with you? Just for a few moments. You see, these are unsettling times for the church leadership of this church, Ebby Church, just now. They're unsettling times. There are interesting challenges around just now. For instance, it's taken a lot of us as the congregation of this church, as the church family, to sort of come back to gathering together. And we've seen numbers just gradually increase as different people have come back. We've had to be patient and kind and understanding. People have had their own reasons for staying away longer. Some still haven't come back even to this point. People that you know, that you're thinking, haven't seen them around on a Sunday. And you've probably got a few names in your mind, haven't seen them around. And it's taking them longer to come back. And you sometimes realise that what we have to do as leadership is we're trying to gather together in person like this, but we've constantly got an eye on how do we reach those who haven't come back to gathering. So we've got to look at the online options. We're still doing some meetings by Zoom from our own homes rather than being gathered together. So I'm just laying that before you. That's a a genuine challenge we've got at the moment. It won't surprise you that also we face very different views from different people on the same matter. I'll give you one example. The matter of wearing masks. You see, some have said, thank you for asking us to wear masks, especially when we're singing worship, because it makes me feel safer. And I can come on that basis. But guess what? Others are saying, we hate masks. <laughs> we hate wearing them. They're a barrier in our worship. So we have to hold those two different, maybe opposing views, in tension with each other, and try and do the right thing. But I'm just saying, it's tough. It's difficult for us. Let's be honest, I think we know of people where this whole period of pandemic has made them make some big life choices. You know, a few families have moved. Over the last two years, they've made the decision to move away, maybe from Bristol, maybe from this community of Hallfield or whatever, just to move away. Big life decision, but they've made that decision. Do you know, as a church, it's so hard for us to say goodbye to someone on one hand, but bless them on the other. And that's been tough as we say farewell to a person, a family, a couple who decided, I'm moving on, and that's tough on us. And lastly, I just want to say our church finances are under pressure just now. Our income's a little bit lower than it would normally be. Our expenditure is high. We are looking at how we might cut our expenditure so that we can kind of balance the books. At the same time, guess what? We're praying to a God who can provide for all the needs. We're generally considering together, can we continue to meet here at Orchard School, given we as a church have the double whammy. You know what I mean, don't you? We've got our own building with all of the expenses that come with maintaining a building, but we hire a school with the rent. So we do both. And we're having prayerful conversation around these things. Now, why am I being this honest with all of you? 
It's not to gain your sympathy, all right? It's not, don't feel sorry for the leadership of the church. But you know, I want to say, we're in this together. We've heard harrowing stories of the struggles that the last couple of years have and continue to be in people's lives. As a leadership team, we're feeling those struggles. We're not just aware of other people's struggles and patting them on the head saying, oh, shame. We're feeling it ourselves. We're experiencing the same struggles and we're looking out for the church and these other unsettling issues, these struggles that we have. And I just wanted to make this very, very simple. We stand together, side by side with one another, in these unsettling times. And I am praying that these few weeks, as we look at 1 John, that this will be an encouragement and a, a confidence and a certainty in us just when we need it. So, let's read the first chapter of 1 John. And uh, this is how John begins his first letter. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light in him. There is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our hearts and in our lives. My dear children, I write this to you. This is into chapter 2, just. I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defence. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. I personally love the fact that the Bible comprises a whole load of different kinds of writing. I've already referred to John's writing. This is a letter. He's written three, and this is the first one we're focusing on. And, you know, when you read a letter, it's a different kind of writing. It serves a different kind of purpose. We read it in a different way compared to how we might read a poem or how we might read a story or how we might read of history. And I love that there are these different writings, but each needs a particular handling, a way of handling so that we might interpret and understand the truth that is being conveyed to us. I mean, this is really random, but one verse from the Bible says this. This is Isaiah. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Now, I think as we read that verse, we might understand, I hope, I think, that the writer is not trying to say to us, trees literally have human hands that clap. 
All right. I think we get that. We understand that, don't we? This is poetry. This is imagery. And he's conveying something to us in a poetic way. And we get that. We understand that. And I think we understand the difference between poetry and illustration and imagery and exaggeration even and metaphor on one hand compared to reading something and understanding it very literally. And I know that can be challenging to us when we're reading the Bible and interpreting it for us today to fully understand well what is imagery, what is literal and how should we interpret this. The reason I say that is because I think John, right at the outset of this letter, is trying to convey to us something very, very literal. And that is concerning the person of Jesus Christ. So John says that which was from the beginning. Now here it is, here's the literal thing he's trying to convey, which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. You see the emphasis there that John is making? We've heard with our own ears, we've seen with our own eyes, we've touched with our own hands. He's trying to convey to the readers, because maybe this was in dispute because of various teachings and philosophies that were going around. John is trying to say, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Saviour of the world, was a real person. He was a real human being who walked amongst us, who lived amongst us. When we talk of Jesus Christ, we're not talking about an idea. We're not talking about a concept. We're talking about a person who lived on planet Earth. Someone who was real, truly human, truly God, fully human, fully God. So that when John said the life appeared, he was talking not figuratively, but literally in the sense of Jesus himself is the very life of God. So that when we receive Jesus, we receive the very life of God. And the biblical historical accounts of the life of Jesus are true. And no wonder then John, in his account of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus, in what we call the Gospel of John, emphasised this. The Word became flesh, made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And John makes several references in his gospel to Jesus as being the Son of Man, as if to emphasise his humanity. Truly God, truly human. And personally, I find this wonderful. I don't know about you, whether you do, but I do. I find this encouraging that Jesus was a real person who lived and walked on planet Earth just as we do. This means... He knows about thirst and hunger and tiredness, just like we do. More than that, he knows what it is to be abandoned by his friends, to be left all alone. He knows what it is to have accusations that are false made against him. He knows what it is to endure unkind words from other people. So there's another element to our humanity that Jesus himself has experienced, just like you, just like me. Even more, he knows what it is to suffer physical, emotional, spiritual pain and anguish. He wept at a graveside, he bruised, he bled. And this means that he has felt and he knows firsthand the experiences that we go through. Now for me, that's a comfort. For me, that helps. For me, 
When I turn to Jesus, it's not that he might pat me on the head and say, there, there, it'll all be better. No, he stands with me in the struggle because he's been there himself. And I want this to be a strength to us, a help to us in these difficult, unsettling times. Jesus has been there himself. And John kind of says, well, I'm writing this so that our joy might be complete. There is joy to be gained from this thought. There, there is strength to be gathered from the fact that Jesus lived on this earth. And I want that to help us. Now John wants to describe something of the relationship we have with God. He says, this is the message we have heard from him, and we declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. And then he embarks on talking about our brokenness and our sin and our wrongdoing and, and how this relates with God, who is light, and the forgiveness that is available. And it just seems to me, um, and, and you can read around John's writings and the times, and it just seems that at the time there was a lot of Gnostic teaching which suggested that the body was bad, so it doesn't really matter what happens in the body. But John says wrong. It does matter. We've got to consider what we do and what we say in the body. So he couldn't have dealings with that kind of philosophy going around. But that philosophy even extended to just about saying, well, Jesus never really was truly human because the body is bad. Jesus isn't bad. He can't have been human. John says, wrong. We saw him. We heard him. We touched him. And this relationship that we can have in God is about living in light living in truth, living in forgiveness, living in fellowship, that is friendship and love and, and unity. And Jesus has made this relationship possible. You see, Jesus, the light of the world, reveals to us that God is light, removing darkness from us that prevents us from seeing clearly, that prevents us from seeing the way to go, that prevents us from seeing the way ahead that prevents us from having clear vision. That's what the darkness does. But Jesus, well, he is the very light of God. He is the life of God. He is the way. He is the door. And that's why when we talk about becoming a Christian, there's a sense that we use language of making a decision to follow Jesus because he is the way. But Jesus is also the truth, and he reveals God's truth to us. He speaks God's truth to us, and he shows us how to live in truth. And that's why when we talk about becoming a Christian, we often refer to believing in Jesus and having faith in God, because this is truth to embrace and to trust. We choose to believe the truth. And it's the blood of Jesus shed on the cross that cleanses us from sin, that brings forgiveness, that removes that barrier of sin that separates between us and God. And that's why when we talk about becoming a Christian, we will talk about confessing our sin to him and turning from our old way of life. The Bible uses, I guess you could say it's a biblical word of repentance, but that's kind of what it all means. And we choose to repent of our sin. We choose to live in the light of God's love. And it's through Jesus that we come to Father God. He is the way for us to have relationship with Father God. It's through him, through Jesus, that we reach God. He is our access to God himself. And that's why when we talk about becoming a Christian, we'll often say... It has to be in and through Jesus. It's got to be. And we choose to come to Father God. So no wonder then that John in his gospel account 
definitely records the words of Jesus himself when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And this is the relationship we can have with God who is light, who is life, who offers forgiveness, who offers our lives to be cleansed of the filth and the dirt and the brokenness, who helps us to be restored, who heals us, who brings us back into good relationship with himself. It's all there on offer through Jesus Christ our Lord. And this is the confidence that John wants us who have trusted in him to know that we have eternal life because of Jesus. And as we walk in relationship with God, do you know something else happens? We walk in relationship with one another. This is not just fellowship with God, it's fellowship with each other. And so John says, so that you also may have fellowship with us. We have fellowship with one another. And that's why one of our emphasis as a church is, we're in this together, let's do this together. And let's work together, let's serve together, let's worship together, let's gather together. It's the togetherness. We need that. It's important. But I think as we walk in relationship with God, we need to have a healthy understanding with regards to our relationship with our sin. And I just want to say two things. I only have to say these in passing because we'll handle this as the series develops. I think, one, let's not live in denial of sin. I think we should guard against it. We should avoid it. We should condemn it. Let's not pretend it's not there. But secondly, let's not live under continual guilt either, because Jesus genuinely has forgiven us. He's cleansed us. He's made us right inside and taken that barrier of sin away. But how many of us live in constant guilt as if we're not forgiven? And this is another area that we can have confidence that we have been forgiven. So what I've done today is just to paint this first chapter and this introduction to the series. I pray that we'll all just have a whole load more confidence and encouragement through our Sundays together as we look at one job.